Brent tells me that most of you are new. <laughs> and so uh, I have, I don't, I don't want to make it sound like I, I make a living at going to places where while I'm lecturing, people look at me like I have two heads. But that happens a lot. Um, and you'll figure out soon why, but don't be frightened. Uh, I'm, I'm not here because I disagree with your doctrine. Uh, I'm here because I agree with it, and I think I can add a little bit of a perspective to it. As Brent mentioned earlier, uh, I did my dissertation on material related to the Divine Council. Specifically, I did Divine Council material in intertestamental, more properly known as Second Temple Jewish literature, um, on up to the New Testament. I did it under a Jewish advisor. Now, that won't seem so shocking the first hour, but when we do the second hour, we're going to spend some time on what uh, is called the two powers in heaven idea. That was the Jewish teaching until about 100 AD or so that there was a Godhead in their Bible. Now, after the church was born and people were running around leaving Judaism and converting to Christianity and praying to Jesus the same way they prayed to the God of Israel, that sort of wasn't popular anymore with the Jewish community because they were losing people to Christianity. So somehow, again, in the providence of God, I got away with that dissertation <laughs> uh, under a Jewish advisor in a Hebrew and Semitics department uh, at a university. So that will be, again, the, the tale of the second hour. So that's by way of preview. Now, what I want to do first hour is, as the first slide says, an overview of the notion of the divine council. So next slide. We're off to a good start. Uh, preliminary thoughts, next slide. Um, there are a few things that if I tell you up front will sort of orient you to how I think. So I think that's only fair. And by way of preliminary thoughts, and this slide will have effects, so you may have to hit the arrow a couple times. We like to talk about interpreting the Bible in context and we talk about grammatical, historical exegesis. And if you actually look that term up in a book, reference book, you'll see something like this. This is from Elwell's Evangelical Dictionary of Theology. Grammatical historical exegesis is the idea that each biblical document and each part of a biblical document must be studied in its context, both its immediate literary context and the wider situation in which it appeared. This calls for an understanding of the following elements. Arrow, biblical languages. Next, types of literature represented, genre. Historical background and geography and life setting. Those are the four things on that slide. Now, doesn't this sound great? Doesn't this sound logical? Yeah, you know, if we go to the Bible, we need to interpret it in its original context, and all this stuff's important. We need to learn the languages. We need to think about literary genre, because believe it or not, genre is something you're familiar with and encounter every day, maybe even every hour of the day, depending on what kind of job you have. You will interpret words differently depending on what type of document they show up on. You have a receipt, you have your tax form, you have a parking ticket, you've got a marriage contract, a divorce, you know, a set of divorce papers, you got a newspaper, you got a text message, you got an email. Okay, all the, I, mean, I, could, I could sit up here and give you 50 different genres that you run into regularly. And they all have one thing in common, they all use words. But when you see a word, okay, a particular word might mean something different if it's in a court document as opposed to the receipt you get at Starbucks. It might mean something different. And in you know, most cases it will. So that's all that's important to think about what is the mode of delivery of that particular piece of literature. So again, all this important historical background, we, we talk about this a lot. And I, <clears throat> I bring this up to ask the question, how seriously do we do it? Next slide. 
there are some things that are pretty obvious to me. Again, I'm just sort of prepping you with how I think here. <coughs> and I think these are very obvious. They might be uncomfortably obvious. I would suggest to you that the context for understanding the Hebrew Old Testament is a matter of its original context. Therefore, it is not the Roman Catholic Church, the Protestant Reformation, pre or late 19th century Christianity, which would include the Apostolic Fathers, of course, 20th, 21st century evangelicalism. None of those is the context of the Bible. In fact, they are foreign contexts when it comes to the Bible. They are alien contexts. The biblical context, lo and behold, is the one that was around when the thing was written. Now, how profound is that? Well, you know, in our day and age, that's pretty profound because we all, you know, again, I'm no different. I, I mean, I didn't like live above this or anything like that. Uh, you know, I became a believer at a certain point in high school. I had no real spiritual background. And so I tended to interpret, to read the Bible through the filter that was given to me at the time. And that wasn't a bad thing. I mean, it, it helped me. Uh, it helped me get from one place in my spiritual life to the next place. But somewhere along the line, it, it occurred to me that, you know, my church probably isn't the context for the Bible. It really isn't. And if I really want to sort of wrap my mind around it, I need to start thinking like the biblical writers did. And that is a, a mountainous task. I mean, I've been through graduates. I don't want to discourage anybody, but... But I still feel like I'm about this far, you know, up the mountain. I mean, it, 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 the more you sort of run into and get exposed to, the more you realize that, boy, you know, it, it's really a difficult task to try to think like they did. But that's also what makes it fun. It's also what relieves you of the notion that, well, I'm going to go to church and I can be bored today because I, I basically know everything. Um, that should not be your experience. And if you're trying again to think like an Israelite, to think like fill in the century, you know, first century Jew, whatever, it is not an easy task. And when you do that, next slide, you run risks. You run risks of people not liking the things that you might come to believe. Uh, you. Again, if you're me, you run the risk of people looking at like, at you like you got two heads half the time. Uh, you might lose a job. Uh, been there. You know, it, it, people are comfortable within the context that they are part of, their church. Okay? It's just the way it is, just human nature. And so when you try to tell people, well, this is okay, but, you know, you, to really understand this, you kind of need to go back like two millennia. Okay, and, and there are things that you can understand better if you do that. You try to make that leap. That will help inform not only that passage, but a whole lot of other things around it and in this thing we call the Bible. And some people will just say, well, it's not in the Westminster Confession, so you must be a heretic. Okay. I mean, I, I see how you got that. <laughs> I see how you arrived at that conclusion. But that really isn't the case, but I know I'm not going to be able to talk you out of that. I would suggest, again, we need to think along these lines. God did not create, this is the next button, a new culture for Israel that was foreign to the rest of the known world at the time. When God decides to step into history and, and have people write this thing that we now call the Old Testament or the Bible, lo and behold, he actually is people, and they lived at a certain time in a certain place in a certain context. And that was, here's the key thought, that was God's business. That was his decision. He doesn't come to them, let's hit the next button here. He doesn't come to them and say, hey, you know, I'd really like to use you to write this book, you know, part of this thing that people later are going to call the Bible. And I'd love to do that. But first of all, you need to sort of know what they're going to know in the 21st century. So let's go to school. Or I'm going to put you in a trance and I'm going to download something into your head so that when you write, the people who are living 2,000 years from now will think, hey, that was just for us. That's how we need to interpret the Bible now. Uh, again, God isn't caring to change who they are. 
He makes a decision. I'm going to prompt this person. I'm, going to, I'm actually not going to just, I don't view inspiration as an event. Prophet wakes up, starts making breakfast, gets zapped. His mind goes blank. He wakes up, you know, 10 minutes later and looks down. There's a scroll there. Like, wow, I didn't know I was capable of that. You know, that's really good stuff. Okay, that's inspiration for the X-Files. Okay, that's inspiration as a paranormal event. Inspiration is a process where God used many hands at many different times, and God had to be interested the whole way. From the time this guy was born that God knew would write this particular book at some point, God was preparing that person for that occasion. All the way, through failures, through his sins, you know, just he was preparing that person for that occasion. And he did that with every biblical writer. He did that with every hand that touched the text along the way. It wasn't, you know, God says, well, you know, I'm going to fit in inspiration now. I've got 15 minutes here because I'm ruling the cosmos. So I'm going to zap this guy. We'll get that done and move on to the next thing I need to do. Okay, we tend to view inspiration like it's just this series of zappings where people's minds are not engaged. Again, that, that's, that's X-Files stuff. So God doesn't change people. He doesn't change their culture. He doesn't say, you have to be different before I can use you to do this. God just says, I'm going to, now is the time. Okay, Israel, my people, is in a specific circumstance. I need you. I've prepared you your whole life to do this one thing. Leading up here, now I need you, Paul, or whoever, to, I need you to write this letter. So, you know, again, God's steering them providentially, the unseen hand of history, getting them to the point where they sit down, they dictate that letter, they write that letter, it goes off to where it needs to go, and then God can, can use that, again, with the people who read it. The Spirit can affect what he wants to affect. God doesn't demand that they be different before he does that. The revelation, you know, if you think about it, if it wasn't this way, if God's zapping people in their heads with material that is just beyond their own audience, it defeats the whole purpose. Because the whole purpose of giving revelation is to communicate. Okay, if, it's, if, it, if it really means that black helicopters, you know, like, you know, that, that's what the book of Revelation is about, or I'm picking an odd example here. But if this is really what it means, I mean, really, 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 then that would have really been meaningless to a person in the first century. What am I supposed to get out of that? No matter what I get, I'd be wrong. Because it really means black helicopters. Okay? So you're really, you're really leaving people prior to the 20th, 21st centuries without a meaningful text is what you're doing. Okay, that is not the way scripture works. Otherwise, there's just no point to it. So inspiration operates, this next slide, next button, within a cultural context chosen by God. God gets to make the choice, doesn't he always? And next button, we honor God's decision to reveal truth to humanity when, where, and in what culture, what time, and to whom God decided to do it. We honor that by just letting it be what it is. So that's a nice pithy way of, of saying we should interpret the Bible in its original context. Translation, let it be what it is. Okay, and what it is, is an ancient Mediterranean document. Okay, the people who produced it and who received it initially thought certain ways, had things going around in their head that help them decipher. Next slide. So the context for <coughs> the Bible is this world right here. This again, it's a, sort of an arbitrary slide. I wanted to find something that showed the whole Eastern Mediterranean, and here it is. So you're familiar with the geography, no doubt. The yellow circle that you can barely see there is ancient Ugarit, ancient Syria. U Ugarit, also known as Rosh Shamra, uh, was an ancient city in what was ancient Syria. I have that circled just to the south, of course, is Jerusalem. I have that circled for a specific reason because some of that material provides the easiest connection 
to the external world, to the, the external to the biblical writer, uh, in terms of what goes on in the Bible in, no, in a number of places. The stuff from Ugarit, they were clay tablets, it's a cuneiform script. When that was discovered in the late 1920s, uh, that provided the most convenient window into the broader ancient context for a lot of the passages I'm gonna show you tonight. And the reason it did was because their language, known today as Ugaritic, how original, it's, it was found in Ugarit, we'll call it Ugaritic. Uh, that language is the, in ancient terms, the closest kin to biblical Hebrew, to the, the Hebrew of biblical times. And so a lot of their vocabulary overlaps. Now let's talk about, next slide would be foundational passages. And we'll hit the next button right away. We're gonna to go to Psalm 82. So here we get into divine counsel stuff. So now you know what this guy in front of you is, is thinking about. I care that we try and you know, that's all we can do, nobody's omniscient here. But we try to read the Bible through Israelite eyes. And if we're trying to think like an Israelite, we also have to understand what an Israelite was exposed to. And Is Israelites have neighbors. They have friends, they have enemies, they have people they trade with, they work with. There's lots of cross-fertilization of culture going on just like it is today. We don't often think of ancient Canaan as a melting pot or this sort of cosmopolitan, you know, culturally cosmopolitan place, but it was. They intersect all the time, either because they're trying to save their own lives, they're trying to make money, or again, they have friends uh, from these other regions. They, they just can't help it uh, to be exposed to what other people in their own contemporary world are thinking. Again, this is no different than us. So Psalm 82, the first verse says God, and you'll notice that's in blue, or at least it's shaded. Well, you can't really see the shading there. Okay, take my word for it. <laughs> I have the word God in a different color there. Uh, this is a screenshot from our software. And when you click on a word, it, it, it'll turn it blue. And what we have here is the first verse. God, and this is the ESV, has taken his place in the divine council. Now in Hebrew, that first word God is Elohim. Specifically, the verse says Elohim Nitzav. It's a participle, singular participle. Ba'adat El. God, Elohim has taken his stand or has taken his place or stands in the council of El or the divine council. El there may be an adjective. It's used that way a couple times in the Hebrew Bible, but I'm not gonna lapse into grammar here. Point to recognize here is that the first word is Elohim. As we go on, next slide. I also, and if you could actually see the highlighting, have the word gods in the second line clicked and highlighted because that word, see if this will work for me, right here, is also Elohim. Okay, so let's go back. Here's this word, our big G, capital G-O-D, Elohim, and the Elohim in the next line of the same verse. Come on. Please. You know, yeah, I'm messing you up. <laughs> Go to the next one. Next one, yep, got it. Okay, yeah, there we go. We'll go back here. So we have the second, G-O-D-S, the plural, also Elohim. Now, I don't know what English translations you use. Maybe you don't use an English translation. But this verse gets tampered with or obscured in a number of translations. Some of them it's actually pretty good. They bring out the fact that both times it's Elohim and the second one is plural, but other times they obscure the second one, the plural one with stuff like mighty ones or strong ones or something like that. 
The issue is, again, here you have God taking his place or taking a stand, standing amid, you know, amid this council, this administration, this bureaucracy, this assembly. And who's the assembly composed of or comprised of? Elohim, plural, gods. Now, this sounds like a pantheon. And you know what? It is. Okay, it is a pantheon. Pantheon is not a dirty word. It's a dirty word if you're talking about you know, polytheism and paganism. You say, well, isn't this polytheism? I mean, we've got plural Elohim running around the Hebrew Bible here. That sounds polytheistic to me. We'll get to that in a moment. It's not. But nevertheless, you have plural Elohim. Next slide. Now, I put Psalm 89 up here verses five through seven for a very specific reason. If you look at a commentary, typically an evangelical commentary and definitely a fairly conservative Jewish commentary on Psalm 82, you might either see the translation that God Elohim takes his stand in the divine council in the midst of the judges. Okay, he passes judgment. You might actually see that second term either translated judges or commented about in that way. The, and the idea is promoted. And we know this is very ancient because this is what's going on in John chapter 10 when Jesus quotes Psalm 82, again, for a specific reason. I don't know if we'll get to that or, tonight or not. But there's a long tradition that says, well, there's these other Elohim. They're just really human judges. They're the judges of Israel. They're the elders. You know, they're, they're those guys. And people can write a, a whole lot about that and sound real impressive. Of course, the problem is, if you actually go back to the, the passage in Exodus 18, where Moses, again, appoints the elders, they are never called Elohim. The word Elohim is in there five or six times, and it's always re with reference to God himself, not them. There is no passage in the Bible, Old or New Testament, that actually refers to the judges of Israel as Elohim, zero. Okay, that is a contrived interpretation to avoid what you're looking at, what your eyes are telling you is there. Now, I put Psalm 89 here for a specific reason, because of the same council language, let the heavens praise your wonders, O Lord, your faithfulness in the assembly of the holy ones. For who in the skies can be compared to the Lord? Who among the heavenly beings, and you notice the footnote there, Numbers 13 and 14 in the interlinear, that's B'nai Elim. B'nai, sons of. Elim is a plural for El, God. The sons of God or the sons of the gods, the divine ones, whatever. Divine beings. Where's their counsel? In the heavens, in the skies. It ain't on earth, okay? These are not Jewish guys, okay? They're not the 70 elders from Moses' day and you know, subsequently on forward. Again, unless you're gonna say that, well, they're really Jews like on earth and they kind of spent some time in the air and they ruled everything. And you know, unless you're gonna really sound absurd, that's what you got. Next slide. You continue in the Psalm, the speaker, again, of the, the Psalm who is God, according to the first verse, at least he's speaking at this point in the Psalm, says, I said, you are gods, and again, you'll see right here, Elohim. I said, you are gods, sons of the Most High, El Elyon, or B'nai Elyon, excuse me. Sons of the Most High, all of you, nevertheless, like men, you shall die, you'll fall like any prince. Now, the point of this slide is, this is the second time we get plural Elohim in the psalm. And they're referred to as the B'nai Elyon, the sons of the Most High. Okay, it, again, if you do a study and you look at B'nai Elyon, B'nai Elohim, all these, these phrases in the Old Testament, that phrase is consistently going to be used of non-human beings, divine beings, who serve at the behest of Yahweh, the God of Israel. Why? Because he made them. They didn't make him. Nobody else made them. He made them. He made everything, all things visible and invisible. Again, we know the language of creation, and it certainly applies here. Now, question, next slide. 
Doesn't saying that there are many Elohim mean polytheism? See, I've, I've anticipated this question because I get it all the time. Next slide. Short answer is no. <laughs> but you know I can't leave it there. <laughs> and I shouldn't. This is a really, again, you're going to be able to draw this conclusion because I think you're going to be able to think well, think clearly here. Let's go, let's, let's approach it this way. In the Hebrew Bible, the word Elohim is used of more than one thing. Okay? Here's the list. We've got God. That's the easy one. It's the one you think of right away. We also have these plural, whatever they are, in Psalm 82. Again, the Elohim of Yahweh's counsel, whatever that is. Third, Elohim is also used of the gods of other nations. I have just one example here from 1 Kings 11.33. Ashtoreth, even, it's kind of interesting. There's no biblical Hebrew word for goddess. Elohim actually gets used for that. Um, there are Semitic words for goddess, but not in biblical Hebrew. So Ashtoreth, Chemosh, Milcom, they're all Elohim. You know, just scattered around the Hebrew Bible. Deuteronomy 32.17, the word Elohim is applied to the word Shadim, which is typically translated in English versions as demons. Uh, you know, I don't want to rabbit trail too far on this, but it's a very rare term in the Old Testament. It only occurs twice. Deuteronomy 32, and then Psalm, I, think, I always get the Septuagint numbering around here. I think it's Psalm 106 in English, around verse 37. I, I have it in here in another place. Uh, I'll give it to you when we get there. It only occurs twice. A shadu was a guardian spirit, a guardian deity, which is very suggestive because when we get to Ezekiel 28 and we get the fallen cherub, who was also a throne guardian, you, know, you, you kind of get the idea. Okay, One of those guys. So, But it's a divine being. We also have the disembodied human dead in 1 Samuel 28, 13. This is when Saul is conversing with the medium at Endor. And he says, I'm in big trouble. I need to talk to Samuel. And she says, well, there's two problems here. Samuel's dead. And Saul, the king of Israel, has said, if we try to contact any of the dead, we're going to be with them. Okay, we're going to be dead, too. And Saul said, oh, don't worry about it. Just come on. I need to talk to Samuel. Of course, we know the rest of the story. She does whatever she does. We're not really told. But she says, when it works, I see an Elohim coming up out of the earth. And then she freaks out. Because when they start talking, and, and, and Saul asks her to describe him. And when she does, yeah, that's him. That's Samuel. I got a question. Okay. And then she knows that, boy, am I in trouble. But, of course, we know the rest of the story. So Elohim is used for spirit of the human dead. And lastly, depending on what you think Genesis 35, when you read that, what, what that episode refers back to, either a group of angels or a specific angel that also happens to be Yahweh, okay, there you also get the word Elohim. Now here's the question. Listen carefully. This question has stumped Bible commentators for centuries, and I think you can do better. If the biblical writer uses the word Elohim of more than one thing, would the biblical writer have thought that the term meant only one unique set of attributes? Dun, 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 dun. <laughs> Duh. Of course not. Aunt Rivka, who's living with the Lord now, who is now an Elohim, is not at the same power level and attribute level as the God of Israel. That would not have stumped an Israelite. Well, I don't know. Maybe she is. Maybe she can go off and create her own world now. No. I mean, this is clear to them. They're not going to assume that an angel is at the same level of the God of Israel. 
they sure ain't going to assume that the gods of the nations are at the same level because of the Shema and other passages. Here's the point. When I, when I show lots of people Psalm 82 and I start talking about plural Elohim, it really freaks them out because they think it's, it's polytheism. It's more than one God. And that's because we, right here, we, when we see the letters G-O-D next to each other, because we're so used to thinking G-O-D as the God of the Bible, we assume that the term carries with it a specific, unique set of attributes. That is not the way the biblical writer uses it. All you need to do, literally, is do a search on it and look at the results. And then give the Israelites some credit. Okay, they are not polytheists. They do not think, again, their deceased loved ones are at the level of Yahweh. I mean, come on. Let's be real. Now that begs the question, though, well, if the term wasn't about attributes, you see what I'm doing here? I'm asking you to let the biblical writers define the term for you. Not the Westminster Confession, not Roman Catholicism, not 21st century evangelicalism. You let the biblical writers define the term for you. What does it mean? Okay. Next slide. Hopefully this little wonderful piece of artwork, if I can use that term really loosely here, uh, will show up. What Elohim signifies, what it is, is what I call a place of residence term. It does not describe what a thing is, its, its powers and attributes. It describes where a thing is from, what its natural abode is. And in the case of all Elohim, all Elohim are inhabitants of the spiritual world. They are by nature disembodied. Think about it. When you die, you don't take your body with you. You go to the, and we, you know, think about all the terminology we use. You go to the spiritual world, you go to the other side, you go to glory, you go, you know, heaven, hell. We use all this, we, we use the language of geography because we have to, and because, you know, it's part of the biblical text too. But we go to this place, this afterlife place, good or bad, where we don't have bodies. Now, we believe that we will get glorified bodies. You know, this is New Testament thinking. It's also Old Testament thinking. But if you live over there, you are by nature disembodied. That's what it means. So Yahweh, oh, Yahweh is an Elohim. He's one of them. But none of them are like him. Yahweh is an Elohim, but no Elohim is like Yahweh. And this is the point throughout the Old Testament of these phrases comparing God with other gods. And basically, there's none like him. There's none beside him. I mean, you've got to be kidding. Of course, there's no one like him. They can say that, and then they turn around, and they, and they use Elohim of five or six different things. Are they nuts? Do they not know the Westminster Confession? Well, no, they don't. Okay. And they wouldn't care. What they do know is they know how they use their own terminology. That's what they know. And we have received it. And again, since we're, we're separated by this gulf, both in terms of chronology and in terms of you know, culture, uh, we have to try to get into the text sufficiently enough and other resources, again, that help us do that, to be able to think like a biblical writer thought so that we can understand what in the world he's saying. So Elohim is a place of residence term. It refers to a realm. Now in that realm, there is rank and hierarchy. Next slide. Now I'm gonna use Ugaritic here as a comparison point, and I'll, I'll get to a few slides later just to sh sort of show you how, how close Ugaritic is to some of this stuff in terms of the terminology used. The, the theology is quite different but the terminology is, is the same. In at Ugarit, at the top of the council, and Ugarit uses the word council, divine council, council of El, they, all the same terminology. You had El, and then he, was, he had a goddess wife, and then you have this sort of, is he the son of El or not, Baal, again, the, the Old Testament bad guy. 
Underneath that, you had the sons of Baal. Okay, and beneath them, you had Malachim. Same word as in Hebrew that we usually translate angel. It just means messenger. Israel, of course, Yahweh is at the, at the top. And again, I believe that the Israelites, Old Testament theology, had a Godhead. It wasn't just one. There was a Godhead, just like in the New Testament. New Testament writers did not make that up. Okay, they got that from somewhere. But there's Yahweh at the top. He is ontologically unique. He has a unique set of attributes. How do we know that? Are, Mike, are you just saying that because that's comfortable for your theology? No, I'm actually saying that because the Hebrew Bible says that. And here's how it says it. Only the God of Israel is credited with certain things. Creating the world, creating all the other Elohim, exercising worldwide global sovereignty, again, omnipotence, all these, you know, these attributes. No other Elohim is ever described the same way as that. Only the God of Israel, and it's consistent. So that tells you to the biblical writer, even though I've got more than one Elohim in my worldview, because, hey, that's just a disembodied being from the spiritual world, and there's lots of different ones of those, angels, demons, you know, my aunt, my uncle, you know, that kind of stuff. Even though there's lots of those, there's only one of Yahweh. There is none like him. And so they describe him in specific ways that they don't describe anything else. And that becomes an, an article of faith. Okay, that is a do or die piece of theology for them. Again, in the second level, you have sons of God, this terminology, and really the ranks are distinguished by, they're, they're essentially job descriptions. They are distinguished by the duties that we can read about that were assigned to them. Bottom tier is malachim, angels or messengers. In theory, any divine being, any Elohim in the spiritual world can, can fulfill the function of a malach, of a messenger. The angel of the Lord does. And he is gonna be called Elohim. In fact, he's gonna be equated with Yahweh. But when Yahweh, God the Father, needs the Malach Adonai, who I believe is the son role, God the Son, when he needs him to do something, he does it. Just like the New Testament. The Father has sent me, I'm sent one, I'm a messenger here. Uh, so there, again, there, the, the rank and hierarchy really refers to tasks. Now the middle task, we're gonna go into Deuteronomy 32, and I'm only gonna mention Daniel 10. Now, if you're familiar with Daniel 10, let's just bring that out here, because I'm gonna spend my time really on Deuteronomy 32. Daniel 10 is that passage in Daniel that links certain divine beings, they're called princes in Daniel 10, to certain geographical places on the planet. Prince of Persia, Prince of Greece, okay? And it's clear from Daniel 10 that we're talking about cosmic divine beings. We're not talking about guys that need to ride horses or in chariots or something like that, okay? So that's an important role. I'll say a little bit more about it as we go. Next slide. You might have, and then hit it once more, you might have noticed actually four more times. So that it looks like this. You might have noticed, well, in that little uh, pyramid thing, you know, there's, I'm looking for some familiar characters and I don't see them. The word demons isn't there, okay, specifically. Again, demon would be sort of at the bottom because in Ugaritic literature, throne guardians are servants in the throne room waiting to get sent somewhere. So a demon is actually, or the, a shadim, that, that kind of person, a throne guardian person is actually at the bottom of the job hierarchy. Now, again, I, I'm not gonna really rabbit trail much tonight unless we do it in Q&A about Satan, Satan. Um, he was not a high roller in the spiritual world, but nevertheless, he was a divine being, and very powerful, and rebelled. But don't get the mistaken notion that this was like God's right hand dude or something like that, and he just lost him. The terminology is not the case. 
You'll also don't see anything about the underworld here. Halal ben Shakar is again a, a phrase that's going to get used later, uh, an idea uh, later used of the cosmic enemy. Uh, it means son of the dawn, Halal the shining one, the son of the dawn. That's not here again because really this, this individual and the denizens of the underworld again are not doing important tasks. You have to think of the hierarchy in terms of tasks. They are there because when you're in the underworld, you're in the spiritual world. And again, you're sort of, if you're human beings, you're waiting. You're waiting for the redemption of the body if you're, if you're among the righteous, if you're among believers. And you're promised certain tasks in the book of Revelation and elsewhere that today these guys are doing. There's a reason, and again, we'll get to it in a moment. There's a reason why sons of God is a New Testament phrase as well that's applied to people, believers. Because we are destined to reclaim the nations of the earth that they presently rule. That is the biblical story. I'll show you how we get there in a moment. We are destined to rule the nations that at present are under the dominion of the sons of God. Um, we displace them. We are God's family. It, it, it's not a mistake that the New Testament uses family terminology and the Old Testament does too. And when the Old Testament does it, it uses it of two things, other divine beings and Israel. Okay, I could throw in the king, you know, but he's Israel too. Uh, again, we'll, we'll get there in a moment. So next slide, or yeah, let's go back here. I just wanna quickly show you, just to, by way of a few examples, the divine council idea does not depend on Psalm 82 or Psalm 89. It has threads running through lots of places in the Old Testament. Here are the descriptions of the divine abode. The divine council meets where God is. He doesn't go to them. They don't call the meetings, he does. Okay. He runs the headquarters. They are where he is. They wait for him to say jump, okay, and they do. They report to him. So there's this concept in the ancient world, and the Old Testament's part of this, that where the, the gods are, and in Israel's case, where Yahweh is, that is the place where the council is, because his home is also the headquarters of the cosmos. Okay, it's not a difficult idea. And if you look at the terminology, again, just by way of, of parallel illustration, at Ugarit, when you have El and Baal at the top, they live at a place that's well watered, source of two rivers, fountain of the double deep. They also, gods live in, in the best places. They live in, in oases-like you know, conditions, well watered gardens, always enough water, always enough to eat, lots of variety. It's just the best place to live. So naturally, of course, the gods live there. They also live on mountains, why? Because back then, people didn't climb mountains like they do today. There was no equipment. They were the most remote places, the deserts, the mountains. But if you're going to pick one of the two, it's always the mountains because you can't get there. You can run around the desert all you want. You might die, but you can't really get on top of the mountains. And so this is why ancient religions of the Near East and, and all over the world thought, they just assumed that, well, if God ever comes to Earth, that would be the hotel he's staying in because that's the one that's most distant from us. He is not like us. We hope he shows up. Hope he's not angry when he does. We hope he shows up. We want to relate to him, but you know there's a, di there's a difference between us and him. And so it was just this conception. Again, we have these kind of conceptions too uh, about, that's why when Jesus comes, it's so incongruous 
and, you know, he doesn't have a pillow to lay his head on. I mean, he's homeless. And again, there, there's just this great incongruity that's very deliberate. But in the Old Testament, again, they live in the best places. So you get Mount Safanu. Okay, the, the, the illustrations here are obvious. You have Eden and Zion referred to as well-watered gardens. Eden is also referred to as a mountain in Ezekiel 28. Uh, the architate Saphon, the heights of the north. Zion is called the heights of Saphon. Well, Mike, is that saying that, that uh, Jerusalem was the, really the home of Baal? No. Okay, the biblical writer is saying, it isn't Baal who inhabits the heights of the north. It's Yahweh. He kicked him out. Okay. Again, a lot of these are theological statements. Uh, designed to dis Baal specifically. He's often sort of in the crosshairs of a lot of this. And elevate Yahweh. The mount of the assembled council, the Pukru Moed in Ugaritic, the Har Moed in Hebrew. Next slide. Again, tents, they live in tents. This is real familiar with the tabernacle. The terminology, you know, Ohel Moed, we have Ohalim, Mish, uh, Mishkanat. Mishkan, you know, the house, the temple, Beit. We have Hekal, Hekalim here. Again, even the way they're described, the courtyard, paved bricks, you know, courtyard of Lapis Lazali, the whole, the, the whole description you can find elsewhere. And again, that's because of a common shared conception. The gods live in the best places and the most remote places because they're not us. We are not them. They are not us. They're different. Now, let's talk about worldview. Two slides. It should be the one that says Deuteronomy 32 at the top. There we go, 32, 8, and 9. Now, you'll notice Deuteronomy 32, 8, the first section, I have the NIV at the top, and I have the ESV below it. You'll notice a difference. Starting in verse 8, when the Most High gave the nations their inheritance, when he divided all mankind, he set up boundaries for the peoples according to the number of the sons of Israel. Verse 9, for the Lord's portion is his people, Jacob his allotted inheritance. Now, if you go down to the ESV, you get all that when the Most High gave the nations their inheritance. He divides mankind, fixes the borders of the people according to the number of the sons of God. Sons of Israel, sons of God. They're different readings. But the Lord's portion is his people, Jacob, his allotted heritage. What's going on here is there is a textual, a manuscript difference, a manuscript discrepancy. The oldest without, again, I, if you want to read this, I have an article, a published article on, that would just numb your mind, I'm sure. Um, on Deuteronomy 32.8 and the sons of God and why text critically, there is no good reason to opt for sons of Israel, just on the basis of textual criticism. The Dead Sea Scrolls read sons of God. The Septuagint reads sons of God here. But you don't need any of that. You know why? What event does this refer to? When do the nations get divided? Tower of Babel. That's Genesis 10 and 11, specifically 11, but 10 counts because it's the table of nations. Did Israel exist yet? No. So why would they say, why would some manuscripts say sons of Israel? PR. PR. <laughs> PR. No, it, it, that's, that's really, that has a lot to do with it. Um, because again, it, it, it reflects an aversion on the part of some scribes to divine plurality. Because who believes in divine plurality? Those weird Christians. Okay, the text, as we know it, the Masoretic text was standardized. That means it was created. Uh, let me, I'll just back up. You know, do you ever get tired of how many English Bibles there are? Okay. <laughs> Okay, their problem wasn't quite as bad, <laughs> but we know from the Dead Sea Scrolls that there were at least three versions of the Hebrew Bible in existence. There was the one that would become known as the Masoretic Text, for the most part. 
There was the one that was the basis for the Septuagint, which was the Greek translation of the Hebrew Old Testament that was done a few centuries before Jesus. That text does not always agree with the Masoretic text. So there were two distinct editions. The third one was the Samaritan Pentateuch. Okay, those, they, the Samaritans only accepted the first five books of Moses as sacred, but they had their own version of them. All three of those are evidenced among the Dead Sea Scrolls, along with a number of other versions of the Hebrew Bible that scholars today just put in a category called unaffiliated texts, which means you know, they don't agree with any of the other ones, but we don't know how many there are. In other words, this is the guessing box. Okay, we're just going to throw that in there. So there were at least three. Okay, not like a hundred like we have English Bibles today. But eventually, the Jewish community, prompted, I'm sure, to some extent, by kind of being annoyed that, you know, well, we got more than one version out here. You know, we've got to do something about this. But not coincidentally, they didn't like the Septuagint because the Christians used it. 80% of the time when the New Testament quotes the Old Testament, it quotes the Septuagint not the Masoretic text. Why? Because it's written for Greek speakers. And that's just kind of the way you do that. That just makes more sense. You don't translate on the fly. You use a version that they can read themselves and go check what you're saying. So the Christians use it. And there are certain passages in the Septuagint that are really convenient in terms of, again, having a different text of the Old Testament. They're really convenient for arguing for Jesus as God. So the Jewish community is like, well, we don't like that. Maybe we can like use this textual, like all these different versions, and we can use that sort of as an excuse to get rid of the Septuagint. And they had another reason. Again, the two powers idea, the two powers in heaven. So around 100 AD, all these things converge, and the Jewish authorities get together and say, look, we're going to standardize the text. We're going to take all this other stuff out here. We're going to decide what our Bible is. And from that point on, it's going to get copied, you know, world without end. And that's what we're going to go with. And that thing becomes known as the Masoretic text. So when you read about the Masoretic text today, that's the thing you're reading about. The thing that was established and published and then began being professionally copied by scribes around 100 AD. Okay. That was a bit of a rabbit trail. Next slide, Tower of Babel, we're familiar with that. So we'll go to the next slide. Tower of Babel I, is also interesting because if you need to know sort of what a ziggurat meant. Ziggurat, the tower, kind of tower that was there. These were conceived of, again, the gods lived on mountains. And in the ancient mind, there was this belief that if you look over here, there was this belief that the world, again, is... Again, you get this from Genesis too, Genesis cosmology. Round and flat, resting on you know, either some waters or you'll get this tree language. And supposedly, there were gateways to the underworld. And this mountain here, of course, led to the top. And this up here is where the gods live somewhere. And there's sort of this, this pole running through the heavens, the earth, down into Sheol, so on and so forth. Now, this is a very common ancient Near Eastern take on cosmology. It's called the Axis Mundi, okay, the world you know, tree, the world axis. Now, a ziggurat, hit the next button. Right here we have a ziggurat. A ziggurat was a place that you built one of these mountains so that the gods would come and meet with you. They were the gateways. They were the places, they were the stopping, kind of like a rest stop. Okay, we build a rest stop, people will stop here. You know? Now we build a ziggurat, the gods will show up. And then we can commune with them, we can sacrifice to them, maybe we can make deals with them, make them money. Yeah, you know, the priesthood really likes this idea, of course. <laughs> Again, this is just the way they conceived of things. So the Tower of Babel, this is why when God says, look, you're supposed to disperse. How clear can the covenant with Noah be? I keep repeating it, and you just don't get it. He tells them to disperse, and what do they do? We're going to gather. We're going to build one of these towers, you know? And then, like, you know, God will come down, and, and we can, here's the key thought, we can meet with God on our own terms. I'm sorry. 
but you can't. The, the Babel incident was actually very similar to the logic of idolatry. If you've never thought about idolatry, what in the world are they doing? What are they thinking? Well, what they're thinking with idolatry, all right, they're not, they're not idiots, okay? You know, it's time to stop slamming the Babylonians. And the, you know, they're not idiots, okay? They know that this thing they're making out of wood didn't make them. They know that. They know where babies come from at the very least. Okay, they're not dumb. What they believe, though, is that when you make one of those, that the God will inhabit it, will indwell it. That's why in Babylon and in Egypt and in other places, they had a ceremony where they give birth to the God, to the idol, and they open its mouth. Why the mouth? Because you breathe through the mouth, and that is the breath of life. So you animate the idol, the God comes down, why do you want the God come down? Because now the God comes to you and you can make demands on it or try to make deals with it. You are trying to control the engagement. This is why when it comes to Israel, God says what? Thou shalt not make any graven image because I can't be tamed. I'm not coming to you. You're not going to make this thing, and I'm, gonna, I'm supposed to go you know, show up here now, and then we have this conversation. I will dictate to you how I will meet with you. You don't get to make one of these. So think of another plan. And while you're at it, you might want to carry out the plan that I'm actually going to give you. All right? It's the same sort of logic. You're trying to control the encounter. And it's just not, you know, it's forbidden in the Old Testament. There's a reason for that. Next slide. Deuteronomy 4 echoes the thought of Deuteronomy 32. Remember Deuteronomy 32, what's going on? God divides up the nations and he does them, he does what? He divides them up according to the number of the sons of God. Well, what does that mean? Well, it means he assigns the nations to be under the authority of other divine beings, not himself. Why? Because, just go back to Deuteronomy, well, go forward to Deuteronomy 32. I think I listed it again. Yeah, I do. The point here, if you look at the wording down here, he fixes, again, the number of nations according to the number of the sons of God, but the Lord's portion is Israel. Israel's my people. I refer to, to this as the Romans 1 event of the Old Testament. Remember Romans 1, God gave them up to whatever they want, you know, I, 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 whatever, you know, you're not going to listen to me, whatever, you know. Just give you up to idolatry and all these other things. This is the Romans 1 event of the Old Testament, where God says to the people after the flood, look, I want you to disperse. We've cleaned up the problem. I'm forgiving you. I'm accepting Noah's sacrifice. I'm going to give you the covenant, the same one I gave to Adam. Be fruitful and multiply. And I want you to spread the, over the earth and you'll be my people. And, and they said, no, no, we're, we're going to do it this way. God says, okay, if you don't want me to be your God, I'll give you your wish. He divides up the nations, puts them, assigns them to other deities, other Elohim, sons of God. And he says, now you know what I'm going to do? It kind of looks like I'm without a people now because I've taken all of you sad sacks and put you under the authority of inferior divine beings. So you know what I'm going to do? I, do, I didn't lose here. I'm going to go over to Ur and I'm going to call this guy called Abraham and I'm going to just give him a you know, voice in the dark and I'm going to call him and I'm going to take that guy and make for myself an entirely new people. So how about that? That's my portion. This is why the rest of the Old Testament is Israel against the nations and Yahweh against the other gods. It becomes a competition. It becomes a fight for authority. Now God, think about the Abrahamic covenant. Genesis 12. You know, I will bless them that bless you. I'll curse them that curses you. 
But in you, through you, all nations, all families of the earth will be blessed. God hasn't forgotten about the nations he disinherited. That's why it's the Romans 1 event of the Old Testament. God disinherits them. Takes them out of the will. But he hasn't forgotten them. Because he's going to say, look, I'm going to start over here. And I'm going to use this people to reach you. And not only that, but there was this other thing that happened in the garden. You know, like, like we still need to take care of that too. The solution to that problem is also going to come from this group, Israel. So the rest of the story in biblical narrative is the process of God trying to re- think, of, think of how many times you've heard these terms. God trying to reestablish his kingdom rule on the earth over all the nations. Lots of problems along the way. Finally, we get the Messiah. And what does Jesus do when he shows up? He announces what is here. The kingdom of God is here. You know what? He actually meant it. And there are lots of things that Jesus does, places he goes, and what he says at certain places that goes right back to here. Because what you have in the Old Testament, next slide. Let's skip that one, skip that one. We'll go right here to the one that has the listing Old Testament cosmic geography. There we go. What you have with the dividing up of the nations and God calling Israel, Yahweh calling Israel as his own. Everywhere they go, this is why God travels with them. They do not have a homeland yet. They've been promised one. Everywhere he is, is sacred ground. This is the logic of the tabernacle. It's the logic of the Levitical system. Okay. Where I am, that is a special place. Where I am, you're not supposed to be. You can only be where I am if you go through these ritual procedures to make sure that you're purified, that you don't pollute the holy ground, okay? This whole logic of divine geography as opposed to profane geography. Well, their little camp is the only place where the Lord's portion is. That means every other place is under the dominion of foreign, unfriendly Elohim. And as they go through to the promised land, they fight all these wars, different events happen at different places. It reflects this division. Well, you know, it's, it's an effort to reclaim the globe, to reclaim that which was disinherited. And God has a plan for doing that. And people, his people, are part of that plan. I love, I'll give you one illustration. I love the uh, Second Kings one. Uh, Elisha with Naaman the leper. I think we can end here. Let me just, yeah. We'll, we'll end here. We can, I have a FAQs after this. <clears throat> Remember the story of Naaman the leper? He has leprosy. And he's really kind of down about that, like who wouldn't be? <clears throat> and he has this little Israelite slave girl in his palace. And she hears about the problem and she says to someone, well, if he just go over to the Jordan River and talk to the prophet Elijah or Elisha, he'd, you know, he'd fix the problem. And so they do that. <clears throat> they go see Elisha. And remember the story, Elisha won't even come out to see him. Okay, you know, I, I heard your problem, and you know, go dip yourself seven times in the Jordan and go away. And he gets mad. Well, isn't the, you know, aren't the rivers back in my country better? And, and the, the point is, it ain't the river. It's not the water. So he goes, dips himself, and he's clean. And he's all excited. He goes back to the prophet, and he tries to give him payment. And Elisha says, no, just forget it. This, this, this one's free. It's on the house, all right? And Naaman then asks a very odd question. Do you remember what he asks? Can I take some dirt back with me? And I'll fill up some bags of dirt and put them on the donkey? Can I do that? Is that okay? Because, you know, like, I'm an important guy back in Syria. 
And one of my jobs is I have to go into the temple of Ramon with the king. And the king's kind of old and kind of feeble. So like when the king bows, you know, I got to kind of hold him up and we, gotta, we have to sort of bow together in the temple of Ramon. So I just want to know if I can take some dirt back with me. Elisha says, sure, that'll work. What is he telling him? What's he asking? Because he's going to take that dirt with him. He's going to take holy ground into that temple because that way he has what? He has a little bit of Yahweh's turf with him, either for protection or to to make it known to Yahweh that that I'm really not worshiping Ramon. I know, if you you read the the passage, it says, now I know who who the real God is. I don't need any other lessons. So I want to take some dirt back with me. This is cosmic geography. Deities are attached in this conception to places. And I am not going on Ramon's territory without dirt from Yahweh's home. That's the whole point. The other example here is Dagon. Remember when Dagon winds up on his face and his head's lopped off and he loses his arms and all that? He's just a stump, okay? There's a little line in, in the narrative when they discover Dagon. It says, and the priests of the Philistines walk around that place unto this day. Where Dagon was found flat on his face, they don't even walk across the threshold. They go around it. Why? Because it's no longer Dagon's domain. Okay, we have seen who is mightier than Dagon. They don't even want to walk on the ground because, again, of this whole conscious thinking. Again, and it stems from this, again, this divine council worldview where God makes certain decisions in the Old Testament. One of those decisions was to punish the nations of the world, put them under the authority of the sons of God, and take Israel for himself. Now, you go back to Psalm 82, and we'll end here. You go back to Psalm 82 and look at it. That is a meeting where God is pretty ticked. It begins, God takes his stand in the divine assembly. In the midst of the gods, he passes judgment. Next few verses, God starts railing on them. Why have, essentially, here's my paraphrase, why are you guys so corrupt? Okay, I said that you are gods. You're sons of the most high, all of you, but you're going to die like men. God is announcing their punishment. They are losing their immortality. Okay, at whatever point God decides, I think it's eschatological because of some things in the book of Revelation. You're going to lose your immortality because you have corruptly administered these nations that I assign to you. The last verse of the psalm, the psalmist says, rise up, O God, and take the nations for yourself. Take, take the world back. It's the whole point of the psalm. But you, again, you have to filter the psalm through what's going on in Deuteronomy 32 and this, all this other stuff.